Greetings in the name of Father God, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit. I am Apostle Sean Johnson, and welcome to Get Right With God. Thank you for joining me. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Get Right With God TV official, and click the bell to get notifications so you will know when I am publishing new content. With that said, let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We give you all the glory because you are worthy of it. And so we thank you, O God, for allowing me to share another message. Thank you for the opportunity. I pray that you would just help me to speak with clarity, speak clear. I pray that those who received will be changed and transformed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, I'm Apostle Sean Johnson and welcome to get right with God. Let's get right into God's word. First Thessalonians chapter number four. And we're going to glance at verses number three through five. I'm reading from the King James Version. Your translation may be different, but the meaning is always the same. Again, first Thessalonians chapter number four, three, four, and five. I'll bring it up for you. First Thessalonians chapter number four, verses three, four, and five. New King James, King James Version reads, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. I want to go back to verse three, the B clause, which says, abstain from fornication. For a moment, I would like to minister from this series entitled fornication fornication from the series entitled strange addictions i would like to teach from the subject fornication let's talk about fornication in the previous message we talked about sexual immorality Sexual immorality is the physical activity and attraction between individuals with the evil ascribed and connection to sexual acts that violate God's biblical and moral principles and standards. Today, let's define fornication. Fornication means sexual intercourse between individuals who are not married to each other. Let me say it again. Sexual intercourse between individuals who are not married to each other. Let me say it another way. It is voluntary sexual intercourse between two unmarried persons or two persons not married to each other. Fornication is the general term usually referring to any kind of sexual misconduct or sexual impurity outside the bonds of marriage. It is often used symbolically in scripture to mean a following after idols or an abandoning of God. Why is it wrong? to fornicate. I'm glad you asked. God is pure. God is holy. God is righteous. And sexual activity outside of marriage is impure. God commands sex to be contained within marriage because it is so powerful. In fact, it is the glue that holds the married couple together and binds 
their spirits to each other. First Corinthians chapter number six, verse 16 NIV says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. Message translation says like this, there's more to sex than mere skin. Sex is as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. As written in scripture, the two become one. See, God created sex with commitment and intimacy for marriage. One woman, one man. One man, one woman. Commitment, intimacy, sex. God created it for marriage. When you get married, God established or establishes his covenant. It's, let me say it like, it's not a contract. Marriage should not be a contract. Something you sign and then, okay, it, it's easily broken. No, marriage is about covenant because God is the third cord in your three-strand cord. God is in the midst of you. God is over you. God establishes covenant and he builds on that covenant. So when you get married, God establish his covenant in your marriage. So it's about covenant, not contract. Genesis chapter number two, verses 18, 24 through 25 says, and the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. It's not good. It's not good for man to be by himself. It's not good for man to be alone. Then he says, I will make him a help meet for him, a suitable partner, a suitable woman who will help meet his needs. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Sound like Adam and Eve, right? The word cleave literally means to stick like glue. God is the super glue. And his plan is for one man and one woman to be bonded together that they become one in marriage. This doesn't mean you cease to be individuals. No, you are man, you are woman. God created you, God created her. You're individuals. You don't cease to be individuals. My wife, Pastor Michelle Irby Johnson would say, do not lose the me in the we. And also something we learned when we went to uh, a Weekend to Remember uh, event for all married couples, uh, Oneness is not sameness. We might be one, but we're not the same. We're two individuals, but you can't you can't lose the me and the we, as my wife would say. It doesn't mean that the marriage is uh, has the potential to offer unparalleled intimacy with another person, like some of these open marriages. Uh huh. In Genesis chapter number two, God said. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Who was they? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were both naked. They was exposed. They knew each other. They saw each other. That was God's intent. That was the first marriage on the whole entire planet that God created. Man, wife. One man, one woman. Man, wife. Marriage. Notice it says the man and his wife and were not ashamed. The only reason you sh you would be ashamed, a man or a wife would be ashamed if you go outside of the marriage. You break God's covenant. He's not going to break the covenant 
with you, with your spouse, most of the time, marriages break covenant with God because they, they choose to go outside of the marriage. Sex is uniquely the, designed to be a blessing. Let me say it again. Sex is uniquely designed to be a blessing and foster a deep bond in marriage. Married couples. In God's eyes, frequent sex not only maintains your connection to God, but connection with your spouse, with each other, and it enhances it. Let me say it again. In God's eyes, frequent sex not only maintains your connection with him to each other, but also it enhances it. That's why you should, you and your spouse should have sex, should, um, you know, get it on as much as you can. You know, um, I understand physical challenges and things like that. But as much as you can to help each other, to be there for one another, to not just be intimate, but but be be sexually intimate, sex, have sexual intercourse as as much as you can, frequent as you can, because it's a blessing. Sex is uniquely designed to be a blessing and it creates a, or fosters a deep bond in your marriage. A deeper connection in your marriage with each, with, the, with each other. Let me go on. If someone tells you that sexual sin, sexual intercourse, sexual Im impurity, sexual immorality, sexual activity, fornication is not a sin, they are sadly mistaken. In God's eyes, it's bad. Fornication is bad. Um, sin is bad. It's sinful. Fornication is sinful. Fornication is wicked. Fornication is unrighteous, unholy, and ungodly. Mm -hmm. Ask the father of a teenage daughter if it's a sin for him to teach, uh, to touch her vagina and, and, and have sex with him. Ask the mother of a teenage son if it's a sin for her to touch his genitals and have sex with him. Ask the, the, the women engaged in their fiance's life if it's okay to have sex with a friend or or, or, or female, another female or another male um, or co-worker or some random dude or some random girl. Ask him. Ask the man gay to his fiance if it's okay to watch porn or and, and masturbate. Ask him. Fornication is not right. Let me say it again. Fornication is not right. It is not right. Fornication is not right. It's wrong. We must not please ourselves with this sin, but take pleasure in pleasing God. In the text, the Apostle Paul says in his epistle, that word epistle means letter. He says, for this is the will of God even your sanctification. Paul's. Jesus had a lot to say about sanctification in the book of John, chapter number 17. In verse 16, the Lord says, there they are not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And this is before his request. Then he says, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification is a state of separation unto God, not apart from God, unto God, apart from the world, unto God. Sanctification is a state of separation unto God. All believers enter into this state when they are born of God, when you are born again. And to be born again, you must be born of water and spirit in order to inherit the kingdom of God. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus. In him, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom 
from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. This is a once for all, forever separation. If you're born again for, for eternity unto God. Once you're saved, you're born again, you receive righteousness, you become holy, which means you walk in holiness and you are you you walk in sanctification and redemption. You are redeemed. You are sanctified. You are righteous. You are holy to God. Amen. It's a once for all thing. We're separated from this world. We're not in the world, but we're of the world. But we're not in the world. Amen. It is an integral part of our salvation, sanctification. It's an integral part of our salvation, our connection with Jesus Christ. The more you remove yourself from the world, the more, the more you remove yourself from social media, the more you remove yourself from uh, TV and movies and all that stuff that will keep you stuck in the world, you become more sanctified. You become more set apart. You, 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 you get more closer to Jesus Christ. Amen. In your salvation. So it's an integral part of our salvation, sanctification, which gives us that that one on one connection, a closer connection with Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the same Greek word as holiness and holiness in Greek is hagios. Hagios, meaning a separation. Sanctification also refers to the practical experience of this separation unto God, being the effect of obedience to the word of God in one's life and is to be pursued by the believer earnestly. First, a once for all positional separation unto Christ at our salvation. Second, a practical progressive holiness in a believer's life while awaiting the return of Christ. And third, we will be changed, transformed into his perfect likeness, holy, sanctified, and completely separated from the presence of evil. So the apostle Paul says in our text that you should abstain which means withdraw or withhold or go without from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess, know how to own his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of sexual desire, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Why did the Gentiles fornicate or commit sexual acts. I'm glad you asked. Acts chapter number 21, verse 25 says, as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strang strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. In the Old Testament, all sexual sin was forbidden, but by the Messianic law and just and, and, and Jewish custom. However, the, the, the Hebrew word translated fornication in the Old Testament was also in the context of, you guessed it, immorality, also called spiritual whoredom. Immorality is also called spiritual whoredom. And as the Israelites became known among the nations round about them for their wisdom, their riches and their power, which was a snare to them as a woman's beauty is to her, they were admired and courted and complimented by their neighbors and so drawn into idolatrous practices. So the word fornication is used in connection with pagan idolatry because much of pagan worship included sex in their rites. Temple prostitutes 
were common in the worship of Baal and other false gods. So sexual sin of all kinds was not only accepted in these religions, uh, but encouraged as a means to greater blessings from the gods, the false gods of the worshipers, particularly in the increase of their flocks and crops. In the Old Testament, fornication was accepted. In the New Testament, fornication comes from the Greek word pornea, pornea, which is where we get the word, you guessed it, porn, which includes idolatry and incest. Pornea comes from another Greek word that also includes indulging in any kind of unlawful lust, which was which would include homosexuality. The use of the word in the gospels and the epistles is always in reference to sexual sin, whereas fornication in the book of Revelation always refers to idolatry. So just like there was influence in the Old Testament with the Jews, there was influence in the New Testament with the Gentiles. And there is still strong influence in the church. There are still strongholds in the church. There is still idolatry going on in the world. There is still wickedness going on in the world. There's still a lot of people, including the saints, who are fornicating all over the place, sinning all over the place and will not give it to God. Paul knew, he knew the weaknesses of men and women and their capacity to fall quickly back into sin after having been saved and becoming members of the church. The world then and the world now has such powerful drawing to these influence influences and these deceiving forces, these demonic spirits that it will draw aside even the strongest Christian, the strongest believer who begins to gaze upon the world to follow the desires or lusts of their own hearts. Amen. First John 2, 16, New King James. King James Version says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It seems that the Corinthian church had become infested or infected with these um, sins, with the idolatry, with committing themselves to fornication. Excuse me. <clears throat> this fornication was not just one of fleshly lust and desire for sensual gratification or sexual gratification. It went far deeper than that. Again, I stated idolatry, wickedness, all kinds of sins. You know, fornication, sexual immorality is the umbrella of, and fornication falls up in the umbrella of sexual immorality. Every facet of life carries with it the potential for being unfaithful to our commitment to Jesus Christ. If you want to be delivered from fornication, you must ask God to, number one, show you. Ask God to show you. If you want to be delivered from fornication, ask God to show you. The apostle Paul said in the text, he said, for this is the will of God. It is not about our will it's all about God's will. God's will should be done in your life. 
the phrase, the will of God has two significations in scripture. Number one, it's the determination of God, his decree. Uh-huh. The other is his desire that in which he delights a will. So he gives each and every one of us a will, which means attached to our will, we have desires, we have feelings, we have delights, but our will should please him in his perfect will. Amen. So God is in God's determination, he made a decree, amen, that we please him in his will. But on the other side of the coin, he there is a desire that he gives us, he gives us, and he delights in a will. If we please God in with our will, amen. God is pleased in his perfect will. All right. I try to break it down to you, but when we when we decide to follow Jesus Christ as one of his true disciples, we 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 promise to keep ourselves to him only. Amen. How many times you made promises to Jesus? Jesus, I'm gonna do better. I messed up last night. I fornicated last night. Uh, my flesh was on fire and I just couldn't help myself. And God, I promise, I promise, I promise, I repent, I repent, I repent. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. How many times have you gone to God? Have you gone to Jesus and say, please forgive me. I'm so sorry. And it don't matter how many times. Amen. It, your sin shouldn't be habitual. You, you shouldn't have to keep doing it. Repent. Repentance means that you you turn away from you turn you turn your back away from it. You never go back to it. Amen. And so you have to make a decision and make up in your mind that I'm gonna follow Christ and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna I'm gonna be all in with Him. Amen. You have to make a you got to stand up to your promise. You got to act on your promise. Stop breaking your promises with God. Stop breaking your promises with Jesus Christ. Just as the marriage vows of a couple who are getting married contain promises and vows one to one of another for a lifetime of devotion, love, faithfulness in every circumstance until death do you part. The, that's a commitment that you make to your spouse. But the commitment we make with Jesus Christ is a lifelong commitment to remain faithful, to remain true. The Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We become a part of the body of Christ, which means we're connected to him. We're connected together with the body of Christ. We are the ecclesia, amen? We are the chosen ones. He chose, he, he chose us to live and stay committed to him. You got to stay committed. Amen. If you are committed in marriage one to another, then each of you have the absolute right to expect your spouse to be faithful to, to and true to you at all times. Just like the marriage with Jesus, the body of Christ is married to Jesus Christ. And he wants us all to be committed. I mean, Christ expects the same from all of us. He wants us to be committed. If you you can't be com committed to your spouse if you're not committed to Jesus Christ. Jesus must come first. Christ expects the same from us if we tr are truly um promised to him if you truly are his servant if you truly are his disciple if you truly are his servant if you truly are his saint stay committed don't commit yourself to fornication commit yourself to the father commit yourself to jesus christ commit yourself to holy spirit he's your keeper god considers it fornication when we are unfaithful to him in any manner. 
any form, any manner, if you are fornicating, it, you're being unfaithful to the father. Whether we are unfaithful in reaching out to souls and gaze in blasphemous, blasphemous um, idolatry or enamored with the things of this world, it's all fornication in God's eyes. It's all sin. Because these things separate us from our complete surrender and commitment to Jesus Christ. Every morning I pray, I said, Lord, I surrender all to you. I commit my life to you. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. You have to commit yourself. You have to surrender your all. I said earlier, you got to go all in. Leave, leave the sin alone. Stop fornicating. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, not the worldly crowd. He talk, he, This letter right here, he's talking to the Corinthians. And this is saying in this letter how bad it was in their lack of commitment, which existed inside the confines of of the church it existed inside the confines of the church because of their lack of commitment it was bad in god's eyes god didn't like it so paul had to speak to him there are many who are not living their lives committed to jesus christ and still claim to be a christian if you take off the in part, Christ. Christian means Christ-like. You have to be committed. It's one thing to, you know, ignore or be ignorant of God's expectations for you. Well, I ain't know about that. I ain't know about this. And then be unfaithful to his call upon your life. But to willfully and habitually sin, fornicate, ignore, reject, refuse to obey God's call over your life to live in holiness and righteousness. You're treading on dangerous ground. And if you continue to live in sin, if you continue to fornicate and you continue to do whatever you want to do, you reject, refuse, you willfully ignore God's expectations, God's will for your life. Yes, hell will be your home. I'm trying to help you. And the only way you won't get to inherit the kingdom of God and get to heaven is if you don't have spot or wrinkle. If you are free from self-inflicted nonsense. That's why you have to ask God to show you you. You have to ask God to show you you i have to ask god to show me me every single day ask god to show you you every day in every way we have to surrender all song says i'm yours lord try me now and see see if i can be completely yours second timothy chapter number two verse 22 says therefore if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from useful lust, flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, pursue righteousness, pursue faith, love, pursue love, peace, pursue peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. That's why we must ask God to show you his will, his way, and his word every day. If you want to be delivered from fornication, you must ask God to 
Number two, sanctify you. Ask God to show you, but also ask God to sanctify you. I shared a little bit early, but I'm going to break it down even further. The text says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, even your sanctification. So your sanctification is in the will of God. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Have complete consecration with him. Walk in complete holiness with him. Our holiness is the great design of Christ's death and is the revealed will of God. Sanctification is eternal and external. Let me say it again. Sanctification is internal and external. Internal sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit. External sanctification arises when from the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. Internal sanctification is the work of Holy Spirit. External sanctification arises from the work of the Holy Spirit. In the world, we must be set apart. Too many Christians think that it's okay to move in with one another shack up with one another and that God will understand God knows my heart and you know forgive them anyway we don't need to presume upon the mercy of God one of our none of us has a a promise of tomorrow and then even if we do live on we cannot come to Christ unless his spirit draws us. The apostle Paul says that we are to stay away from and not associate with those in the world. Those who call themselves brothers and sisters in the body of Christ and who are living lives of unfaithfulness or fornication against God. Don't even get wrapped up and tied up in that. You got to stay faithful. You got to stay true to God. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived or misled. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God is not easily deceived and or as easy persuaded as, as men are. Men are easily persuaded. Men are easily appeased. Many Men are easily drawn in. That's why he gives us a will. You can do it. You can do whatever you want. You have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. But if you desire to live in God's perfect will, you can't do everything that you want to do. Pastors, elders, preachers, and teachers in the church might smile and turn their eyes away and, and turn a deaf ear to unfaithfulness. But God, the righteous judge, never misses a thing that we do. He even know the numbers, that the, the number of hairs on our head. God knows everything. God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. Omnipresent. He's everywhere. He knows everything all about us. He created us. He don't miss a thing. And we will have to answer to our foolishness. We have to answer to our sin. We have to answer to our self-inflicted nonsense. There is no gray area in the mind of God. We are e either living right or we're not. We're even either living right or we're not. We're either sanctified or we're not. We're either saved or we're not. We're either holy or we're not. We're either delivered or we're not. We are either living right or we're not. God knows the difference. And in the end, he ain't gonna let it slide because if you if a person is still sinning up into the very, to, to, I, Jesus Christ, every man gonna be judged. Every man. There's a judgment at Christ's return. 
when the believers will receive their rewards. But there's a judgment, a great white throne judgment when everybody got to approach God and answer to God. And if he don't know you, he's going to say, depart from me, ye work of iniquity. And so that's why we must ask God to sanctify us. You got to ask God to sanctify you and to live in his will, his way, his word every day. I got one more. Y'all want to, y'all want to, y'all want, y'all want it. Y'all want to get it. All right. Got one more. All right. If you want to be delivered from fornication, you have to ask God to lastly, number three, sustain you. Ask God to sustain you. Ask God to show you. Ask God to sanctify you. But also ask God to sustain you. If you want to be delivered from fornication, ask God to sustain you. Let's go back to the text. It says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. In other words, we have to learn how to control our bodies. We have to learn how to control this flesh because this flesh will fight you every single day. You have to learn how to possess your vessel. Amen. You, The Israelites were out of control. The Jews and Gentiles were out of control. And the church is out of control. If you're fornicating all over the place, Spreading your wild oats, you are out of control. The body of Christ has to learn how to have self control. Galatians chapter number five, verses 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such the, the things, there is no law. We have to have self-control, people. This flesh, you got to let this flesh, the Bible says, let this flesh die daily. The flesh is always worn against the spirit. But we can have self-control and, and not let the spirit win over you. Amen. Not only self-control, but you have to have self-discipline. You have to learn how to discipline yourself. I'm married and I have desires and it's a struggle every single day because my libido, I desire my only desire my wife. I don't desire another woman. I don't desire a man, nobody. My heart's desire is God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, my wife. Amen. And so when times, there are times when you are not, when she's, when we're not, you know, tired or whatever like that. Yeah, you, you, you got to hold yourself. You got to pray. You got to seek the Lord. You got to ask the Lord to sustain you, to help you in those moments. You, if, if your flesh is on fire, go to God. Stay busy. Do something. Clean the house. Go to a movie. Do something to take your mind off it. But apostle, it's, it's so hard. I, I can't deal with it. I can't do it. It's hard. When God gives us the fruit of the spirit to sustain us, he gave us the ability to control or restrain ourselves from all kinds of feelings, impulses, emotions, and desires which includes the desire for physical and material comfort. Sometimes our flesh causes us to succumb to uh, the persistent pull and tug. You ever feel that pull and tug? You know, man, it's hard. It's a, you know, I'm home by myself and I feel this pull and tug, this pull and tug, this tug and pull of sexual sinful desires we're all human we're not all super spiritual super holy you know 
We don't always operate in the spirit and prophesy, speaking in tongues all day long. We're human. You know, we all got jobs and we all got lives and we all, you know, we, we still do some things, you know. But yeah, the sin, those desires will rise up. We'll try to overtake you. The Apostle Paul calls us to purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. I like that. Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. That word reverence means having a fear of God, for God. It's not like being scared. Oh, I'm scared. You know, I'm, a, you know, not, not, not that time. I'm scared of darkness. I'm scared. Of, no, like reverence. When you reverence the Lord, you're fearing God. Amen. You're giving him what's due. You are, you're, you're, you're acknowledging that he's holy and you're acknowledging he's helping you to be holy. But we have, but as we are continuing to, on this journey of sanctification, we have to perfect holiness and don't allow things to contaminate our bodies, contaminate our spirits, contaminate our minds. We are called to be, to purify ourselves from everything, like Paul said, everything, everything. Amen. Romans 12, one through two says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is one of my, including in my daily prayers. Present your bodies a, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. Every single day, it should be a, it should be a spiritual service worship every single day you should want to live holy every single day you want to be accepted by god every single day you are to be a living sacrifice every single day present your bodies to god amen do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. Discern what is the will of God. It got to be an everyday thing, y'all. You got to transform your mind. Take your mind off the world. Transform your mind. Renew your mind every single, how do you renew your mind? In prayer. How do you renew your mind? In the word, how do you renew your mind? By fasting. How do you renew your mind? By going to worship services, by worshiping God, by praising God. Amen. By just discerning what is the will of God. What is the will of God for your life? Then it says, what is good and acceptable and perfect? What is good and acceptable and perfect? So I encourage you all to stay in God's perfect will for your life. Fornication is not in the will of God. Let me say it again. Fornication is not in the will of God. He will deliver you and sustain you. Sustain means that we have to withstand. Ephesians chapter number six, verse 13 ESV says, therefore, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Ecclesiastes chapter number four, verse 12 says, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And threefold cord is not easily broken. Sustain means that we have to bear. Romans chapter number 15, verse one says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. First Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful and God is faithful and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. 
my God from Zion, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. One translation says he'll provide a way of escape. Amen. You can endure, which means which, which this is what sustain means. Sustain means to endure. Jesus says in Matthew chapter number 24, verse 13, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold or wax cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Second Timothy chapter number two, verse three says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Sustain means that we have to stand. First Corinthians chapter number 16, verse 13 says, Be on your God, stand firm in the faith, be courageous. That word courageous means bold. Be strong, be bold, be strong, be courageous in your faith. Stand firm. Be on your guard. Have you know boxes, you know, when they box, you know, let me, let me I'm gonna take a little uh, a sidebar. Boxes they box, you know, they got the guards up. Hey man, you always got to have your guards up because you just never know when the enemy is gonna come and try to punch you, try to uppercut you, try to catch you off guard. You gotta have your guards up. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be bold, be strong. First Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Galatians chapter number five, verse one says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, in the freedom wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So if the yoke of bondage with for fornication, don't be don't entangle yourself with fornication ever again. Free yourself and stay free. Psalm chapter number 54, 4 says, surely God is my help. God is there. He's all of our help. All of our help comes from him. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. That's why you must ask God to sustain you to be free in his will, his way, and his word every day. As I close, I want to just say, I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for being a seer to show you, you, even when you can't see yourself. Thank God for being a, a sanctifier to sanctify you, even when you can't sanctify yourself. Thank God for being a, a sustainer to sustain you, even when you can't sustain yourself. And from this day forward, I want you to be totally committed to Jesus Christ. I want you to be totally to committed to Father God. I want you to live in holiness and righteousness. I want you to walk in holiness and rightness before God. From this day forward, be unspotted and be unblemished before God. From this day forward, keep yourself pure and holy before God. Jesus brought us with his own blood that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Let's include fornication. That's the any such thing. He want his church to be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I know it's hard, people. I know it's hard, but God. I know it's a challenge, but God. I know um, you have to have it all the time, but God. 
I know you want to get get in get the get get the draws. Uh-huh. But God. I know you want to get your fix. But God. I know you want to foreign to porn. But God. Your one thank you, Jesus, away from your miracle. You are one shout away from your breakthrough. You are one hallelujah away from your deliverance. Song says, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. You have to declare the victory today. It's yours. Victory is yours. We were never made to be defeated. Then song says, I told Satan, get thee behind victory today. Is mine. You got to tell Satan, get behind you. You got to tell fornication, get behind me. It's over. You got to tell sexual immorality, get behind me. It's over because today you have the victory. You have to declare the victory in your life. Flee from all sexually immoral acts, which includes fornication so you can be free to give God the glory in your life and in your body and if you want to be delivered from fornication God will show you you God will sanctify you and God will sustain you let him do it for you let him do it for you Today, I decree and declare over your life that you are free from fornication in Jesus name. Amen. If you want to live, not die from your sin, including fornication, I invite you to surrender your all to Jesus Christ, who is and want to be your Lord and Savior. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, God doesn't want you to perish. That's why he sent son Jesus Christ. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to have eternal life. Not eternal damnation. He wants you to have eternal life. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. To give your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you're serious about surrendering your all, including your fornication to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me. You ready? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I want to be saved. I repent of all of my sins. I repent of my foolishness and my fornication. Please forgive me. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Save me, change me, transform me, free me, baptize me, deliver me, sanctify me, show me, sanctify me sustain me, free me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Replace my carnal identity and mentality powered by fear and fornication with your kingdom identity and mentality powered by fear so I can have eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to welcome you 
to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. As a believer and a kingdom citizen, you must find yourself a Christ-centered kingdom-driven ministry with a Christ-centered kingdom-driven pastor or leader so they can help you to grow. So you can they can help you to sow, reap, and expand in God's kingdom. On this journey with Jesus, you got to find yourself relationships. You got to connect yourself with people. So, so they, so you get yourself in Bible study, uh, st read God's word, meditate on God's word, study God's word, stay in God's word, pray, pray without ceasing, pray fervently, fast. Amen. Surround yourself with kingdom minded believers with the body of Christ so they can help you to become an effective disciple so you can share your testimony, how Jesus saved you how Jesus delivered you from fornication or from any other sin from the, from this world. You know, we all got to be witnesses in this world. We all have to share our testimonies so we can let sinners, backsliders, family, friends, neighbors, even our enemies know that they need to get right with God so they can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Look, time is running out, people. Jesus is returning. His return is intimate. No imminent, no man knows the day or the hour when the son of man shall appear. Get your life all the right, right with God. So you can be ready when he returns. Amen. Amen. Once again, I want to welcome you to the family of God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A few announcements. I'm going to pray and then we'll wrap up. Connect with Apostolic Grace Evangelistic Fellowship, where we are winning souls for God's kingdom. Visit our website at www.agefellowship.org. That's www.agefellowship.org. Or Sean Johnson Ministries website at www.seanjohnsonministries.com. That's www.seanjohnsonministries.com. Watch Get Right With God TV official on Sundays at 12 o'clock p.m. on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, share, and get notifications. I have playlists, um, videos, probably right now, maybe close to 250 videos out there, past, present, and now some new future videos, future messages that I'm working on. And I just want to share with you. I just want to share the gospel, and I want you to share the gospel. All right, with everybody you you can reach out to. Get right with God, TV official on Sundays at 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube. Subscribe, share, get notifications. You'll know when I'm publishing new content. And most of the time I'm, I'm pre-recording and most of the time I'm going live. So make sure you go out there and watch the videos and share. Amen. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's close out. Father, we thank you so much, God, for this message. We thank you, God, for what you have said and what you're doing in this world. Father, I pray, God, for souls, for the lost, for the backslider, for that individual who may be a believer, who may be a Christian, and, and, and they struggle in their flesh. They struggle to flee fornication. I pray for those individuals even now that you would just touch that she will deliver send deliverance in the world send deliverance in the nations send deliverance in america send deliverance in every home god in every person and i pray that you would destroy the stronghold of fornication that you would destroy the stronghold of sexual immorality that you would destroy the stronghold of sin over with people's lives and touch their hearts, send revival into the hearts of those who have a desire to be in Christ Jesus. So they, so he can be their Lord and Savior. So they can be changed. So they can be whole and free from the sin or the strange addiction called fornication. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for tuning in to Get Right With God. I am Apostle Sean Johnson, 
Souls must be saved. Lives must be changed. Do not wait. Do it now. God bless. God bless you. Hallelujah.